So hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're here to share some um, thoughts and ideas around the pandemic and education. Uh, my name is Sarah Sivers. I'm educational psychologist at Southend, and I'll pass over to my colleagues to say hello. Sarah, do you want to go first? Yep. Hi, everyone. It's great to be here. I'm Sarah Wendland. I'm also one of the educational psychologists at Southend Borough Council, and I'll pass over to Maddie, who can introduce herself. <laughs> Afternoon everybody, it's Maddie Papuna here, um, Educational Psychologist and MHST Service Manager for Nottingham City Council. Siobhan? Hi everybody, welcome to the webinar. Uh, it is really great to be here and to be collaborating with Southend again. Um, my name's Siobhan Curry, I'm an Educational Psychologist in Northamptonshire. Thank you. And yeah, it's really exciting to have more and more people join us and, and join this kind of bit of a crusade that we've been having over the past couple of years to really think about what's happened to the children and young people during COVID. And so I wanted to kind of um, raise that up again with this last EP reach out of the year um, and really take some time to look back and reflect over the past few years, because we don't feel that's really happening, certainly not. Um, having the opportunities for schools to reflect on what's happened. Um, and we know that COVID-19 has had a real significant effect on children and young people's development, emotional well-being and education. And we need to take a bit of time to acknowledge that, think about that. So that's what we're going to do today and hopefully it will generate more conversations. We're all on Twitter. We want you to kind of engage with this as a discussion today and in the future. Um, so we're going to draw on the research that we've all done and um, use some ideas that, that we've thought of using psychology to, to kind of really think about how we can recalibrate and look forward with hope um, for children and young people. So just a really quick whistle stop tour of the kind of beginnings and connections that we've made. Many of you will know that here in Southend, um, we sort of thought about doing some research right at the beginning of COVID-19 to explore the voice and experience of children and young people. And we didn't know at the same time that Siobhan was doing the same sort of thing in London with a charity called Youth Works. So um, then we kind of, Maddie and um, Southend connected up and we did more research, which kind of we were invited to write a chapter and Maddie and I wrote a report for a book and we did webinars and all sorts of things to get the information out there. Um, and then we um, created a wider group which was kind of called the Pupil Views Collaborative Group and again found, um, gained more responses about the return to school in 2020. And from that, we had about 6,000 responses. And again, we did reports, webinars, and, and a lot of what we're talking about today is based on that data, what children and young people told us when they went back to school. Um, and then, yeah, in the, early this year, we linked up with Siobhan, who kindly invited us um, to prevent, present at the British Psychological Society Crisis, Disaster and Trauma Section Conference. So that's how... Um, we've connected together and Siobhan's going to tell you a little bit more about that section now. Yes, thanks Sarah. It's really nice to have an opportunity to plug the crisis, disaster and trauma section with educational psychologists. It's a broad section with a trauma focus across the whole age range. Um, I think EP's interest in it has been mainly related to responding to critical incidents. So we've had lots of uh, resources and input on that. And um, on our website, you'll see a publication that I did with um, Ben Hayes from UCL about EPs responding to critical incidents. That's a really useful resource. And that's just one example. Um, there's lots of things that are relevant to our work particularly now heightened by the pandemic um, and the work on refugees, for example, and unaccompanied asylum seeking children. We've got a conference on that in September um, and children who are fleeing conflict zones and coming into schools. 
and it, it's it's a, a lovely sort of multidisciplinary section and I'm always sort of shouting up for children and young people and um, alongside a lot of other EPs who come to some of the um, webinars and the conferences. Yeah, so we had a webinar um, about uh, June 21 about fostering hope um, and then we did a a symposium at the BPS conference when I um, put forward um, about the children and young people's views and, and promoting the work of EPs. So it was really great to collaborate with Sarah, Sarah and Maddie. Um, and we um, delivered this um, second webinar um, and we were able to put forward our our research. Yeah, go ahead, Sarah, let's go on to some of my findings. So yeah, at the same time that uh, Southend started their survey, I started one in, in Northamptonshire with um, an organisation called YouthWorks, and we got almost a thousand responses. Um, and these are just some of the key findings. Obviously, it's, it's a big report. Um, the questions we were asking were about how had mental health and well-being, emotional well-being been affected? Um, and we were really keen to find out what coping strategies young people were using, what did they find helpful, and how did they feel about going back to school, and what would they like to be in place when they went back to school? What, what was it that they thought would help? That finding about 33% there saying that their well-being was worse or much worse during lockdown, that's quite, quite a common um, finding amongst all the surveys. If you look at the surveys in other places like Young Minds and what have you, you'll see that that's, that's, that's quite, um, quite a common finding. And that's the kind of amount of young people that we're talking about who's, who feel that their uh, well-being is much worse. And that's much higher than you usually expect because national sort of findings about well-being, like the Office of National Statistics, that's about sort of usually about 6%. So it is a lot higher. Um, one of the questions we that intrigued us and surprised us and we wanted to sort of ask more about was, how come 20% of young people found that their well-being had improved? Um, have we sort of really acknowledged um, that these young people um, found that being at home um, improved their well-being? And, you know, get, are these some of the children who are finding it really difficult to go back to school? I'm sure it uh, be interesting to find out what, EP's experiences of that. Um, just a few other things to highlight. Um, Socialising with peers was one of the main reasons for looking forward to going back to school. And, and again, is that something that schools have really sort of taken on board? Is it something that we facilitate? Um, because we know that social support is a huge protective factor in resilience and, and positive mental health. Um, but as Sarah said in the introductions, kind of back to business as usual kind of model, I'm not sure we're, we're facilitating or helping um, young people to sort of reconnect with their peers. And the support that young people identified themselves that they wanted when they went back, there was sort of a lot of um, concerns about careers uh, going forward. And I think less stigma around seeking support for mental health and well-being, um, which is a positive thing that we can build on. I just put in one of our um, pie charts, uh, there's quite a few in our report about coping methods used during lockdown because it was quite um, interesting and revealing. Um, yeah, um, video entertainment uh, is, is high on the coping strategies. Um, 
but also things like creative hobbies, including baking and gardening. I think definitely some young people welcome that opportunity to have more time um, with people at home uh, that they could mix with and spending more time as well on self-directed learning, having more opportunity to sort of research and um, follow up on things that they were interested in. So yes, I've put the link in there for our full report, but uh, it's great to uh, share this research with you and to sort of see where the crossover points are with um, the other projects. Thanks, Siobhan. And there was so many crossovers as well. And this is just a quick overview of the sort of the themes that we highlighted through our Pupil Views Collaborative Group. And there, the connections between the two um, research projects was just huge, you know, well-being being a really key factor, relationships, that physical environment, how they've experienced their education, and it being a real mixed um sort of a mixed bag of what came back from really positive experiences through to some experiences which were quite difficult and maybe a little bit more um, challenging for our young people and vice versa so it wasn't one size fits all it really was a real um, combination of how their experiences had been and and what had impacted on those experiences as well depending on um, how they'd had their learning how their home environment had been their contact with different people so it was such a privilege to hear all of our young people share their views and they did share them very very openly and very widely and it was clear that they were so keen to have their voices heard which wasn't really being portrayed in the media or through other aspects um, through there, they really were sort of the forgotten voice through this pandemic. Um, so that's kind of a bit quick overview of what we wanted. You can watch our YouTube bit, um, webinars about our specific researchers and the links for the reports are also in the chat. So Sarah, I think we can jump straight on. <laughs> and from all of our research, we really started to think about education we started thinking about the current system and really wanted to think how can this be changed what can we learn what can we reflect and we came up with these four questions which we've been pondering and going back to on and off um, since we've done the research to really try and think about how it can be different and it really was about thinking about a young person's agency and autonomy how can we help them feel seen heard and appreciated how can we make sure their voice is a real key part of our planning. And thinking about that planning, how do we begin with the end in mind? What do we want our young people to achieve in their education? What do they want to achieve in their education? And is our current model fit for purpose? Is it doing what they need and what they want? Um, and especially picking up on those aspects that they really enjoyed during lockdown, that creative, that vocational aspect, thinking about the 21st century and how are we preparing them for life? Um, a really key one, relationships. How are we providing those positive, nurturing relationships that our young people want, need, and potentially are missing out of at times um, through their education? So how can we do that? What, what is in place? And also, how does that link to their well-being and their learning? How can we make sure that that is a priority within the curriculum, within what we're doing, and a real integral part of all of our school communities of that relational approach um, and finally that physical environment we had so many young people talk about the physical environment and very commonly toilets you know their basic needs of how they weren't very nice experiences you know they weren't welcoming they weren't environment and with all the added extra um sort of social distancing the the aspects of the pandemic which really highlighted actually that basic need sometimes wasn't there or they felt like it could have been improved and how that environment was making them feel and how that made them want to engage and interact as well so really thinking about those different areas um, and hopefully what we're going to do now is try and answer some of your quest these questions as we talk about it we will see 
Yes, thank you, Sarah. And and exactly, we're just going to move into that idea of we started with. How do we pause and reflect? How do we sort of bring those questions into the the thinking around education? And and there is now a sense of business as usual. Schools are, are, are back, and we're not really thinking about what did happen. And um, you know, I think it's detrimental to think we can just pick up where we left off in March 2020. We need a change in education before COVID. Kind of need it more than ever now. But as we've shown with our research, there are things we don't have to throw everything out. There are really positive things that happened before COVID and there are really positive aspects from COVID with hybrid learning and, and just, you know, that idea around emotional well-being. So we, we need to pick up what's happened and what we can move forward with. Um, and, you know, there are some... You know, there's some challenges around that. And just as educational psychologists, I'm really aware of going out to schools and, and lots of conversations with teachers who are really trying hard to get the classes learning, um, you know, get children integrated back into school. And, and they're really worried about groups of children. You know, it's not just individuals now. It's almost whole class groups. Year three are really struggling. Year eight are really struggling. And actually, if we stop and think and kind of go, if we go back two years, would that match the development level of this child or young person or group? And the common answer is yes. So I think we really have to acknowledge that these this two years of missed or different or um, unsettled education has had a huge impact on children and young people. And we can't just brush it under the carpet. It and, and sort of go with this business as usual narrative we have to kind of think about what's happened and use that information and you know that there are challenges and just sort of picking up on really briefly some of the political challenges that we're seeing at the moment which really maps onto these ideas of business as usual and not reflecting we, we've just had this week the news come out about the, the SATs that children and young people needed to sit this year. And, um, you know, most of it is not going to be reported. There's almost a sense of what was the point. Um, the, the kind of education minister that was in post at that time, I think we've had a few since then, um, stated things like it was good to get a baseline level to understand how COVID had impacted on children and young people's learning. As professionals working in education, we didn't need that baseline learning and actually we didn't need to put the children and young people through that emotional turmoil of, of sitting things like SATs and, and having that happen, or the teachers actually. So, you know, it really does take us back to the fact that people didn't think about that impact. It was just business as usual, let's just do the SATs and see what happened. Um, you know, we've got guidance, policies and narratives coming from the DfE, the education white paper and the SEND review, where a lot of the thinking is around behaviour, managing behaviour, changing behaviour. It's very little in there actually about emotional well-being and mental health. Um, I did a real kind of basic search of how many times mental health and emotional well-being comes up in the white paper and it's about three times compared to about 32 times that behavior is mentioned so that kind of gives you the idea of the ideology and the narratives being used so I think it's something that we've got to really think about and you know we've had three different people as secretary of states in three days last week you know we're we're in a, a kind of a time of change but I think that could be a positive time of change as well where we can get new people to listen and, and think differently about education and that's what we hope to kind of do a whistle stop tour of now and um, think about what what changes could we put in place I think this is over to you Siobhan thanks yeah I mean I think we all sort of made some conclusions and recommendations from what young people had told us and that's what we're really trying to to get across and and encourage schools to do more of um, there's some sort of basic practical things we knew that the number who were requesting 
um, more well-being support and, and more time for um, thinking about what had happened to them and reflecting on it themselves, we knew that that had, had been increased and that and in my survey, the amount who said that they would go to a well-being group was more than I'd seen in, in other uh, similar surveys before. Um, so, yeah, let's help. We, we know we can help schools to um, identify those young people. The other thing that came out was providing additional career support um, and guidance and guidance around uh, leaving school and, and what you could go on to and how this had impacted you. Obviously, a lot of worry about that, which really young people need sort of more time to, to talk about that and to, to access career support, um, which I don't see hugely uh, in my own secondary schools. The other thing was this independent, self-directed learning time, which uh, young people were saying they'd actually enjoy doing more independent learning. And have, have we kind of looked at the curriculum? Could we look at the curriculum and, and think more about that? Could we kind of try to promote a little bit more autonomy in learning? and a little bit more opportunity to follow uh, your own interests. And the other main theme that I mentioned in our findings was this time for rebuilding the social connections and focus on relationships and that social network of support. Um, we did say things that the government could do. It might be a little bit pie in the sky. And, and since we wrote this, <laughs> Things seem to have gone to the opposite extreme. Um, I mean, we have got mental health support teams in schools. I know a lot of EP services are working with them. So it would be good to have these conversations with them and, and sort of make links in terms of how we can support that. Um, but obviously, as, as Sarah mentioned, what I'm finding is that the priority seems to have been catch up academic wise and um, getting back to business as usual in terms of assessments and, and gradings and things like this. Uh, so yeah, hopefully um, we can use some of this research to try and talk to schools and help them to reflect on what's going on. And um, if we go to the next slide, Sarah, there's just some things that there's a really great um, uh, resource at the Anna Freud Center um, website, which did this, it's called the Emerging um, Evidence-Based Practice Unit. And the Emerging Evidence, they collate all the findings from all the research that's going on around um, the pandemic and what children and young people are saying. And they've identified as well some of these things, which go very nicely with, you know, I know what a lot of services are doing around promoting things like Action for Happiness and, um, you know, resilience programmes, things like this, lifestyle and behaviour factors, sleeping patterns, screen time. And as uh, Sarah mentioned, this sort of focus on our physical environment and um, how welcoming, supportive, accommodating um, that is, how it facilitates social connections, learning relationships. And what we haven't had a lot of time to mention, which comes up a lot in this um, collation of research is support for parents. So I wasn't able to go into that much in my survey, but obviously, it's a time at the moment, there's huge stress on parents, sort of socioeconomic factors, et cetera. Um, so it's, can we think of ways of, of seeking parents' views and thinking about parent support, parent and carer support at the same time? Thanks, Sarah. 
it's me hi so um <laughs> i um i've been thinking a lot recently um alongside alongside colleagues here around the good old um decky and ryan theory um around self-determination um, and how that links to the research that we've done um and i guess also just to, to new ideas in education um, and there's some really interesting links on slides to come um, from some kind of more progressive groups, um, progressive education, rethinking education, um, who are really trying to consider this idea of autonomy and competence in learning. Um, and I was thinking about this in relation to the education system and, you know, the idea of autonomy and don't our children coming into early years with this kind of autonomous play based provision where they are free to explore the world and um, choose what they want to do, choose their friendships, choose what they do with their time. Um, and that idea of kind of free roaming. And by the time they kind of hit, you know, secondary school and certainly by, by the end of secondary school, where is that autonomy? Um, you know, it's very slowly and systematically seeped from them um, as they go through our education system in that they're told what to wear, where to sit, when they can go to the toilet, who to sit next to, how long they can have for their lunch, in some cases what options they have for their lunch. Um, and actually most of the time what to learn. Um, there's very very little choice um, in terms of autonomy and, and through the pupil views work children are saying to us we want to have more choice and the research done by Decky and Ryan links self-determination to the idea of autonomy so if our children are, are lacking in autonomy through our education system and their motivation and their determination is therefore decreased why then are we talking so much within our education system and in, and in white papers and green papers about behavior because surely that behavior is just a response to a lack of autonomy, a lack of a sense of competence, um, and a lack of sense of self-determination. Um, so I suppose when you really think about it, it's, it's a no-brainer, isn't it, um, as to why we've kind of created the system of exclusion and isolation and detention and all the, all the punitive um, and draconian things that we, we place upon our own people. Um, so I've been listening to a lot of podcasts recently as well from Rethinking Education, and I won't go into too much of it, um, too much of it now, but um, there's a really interesting podcast that we can put the link to again um, on the chat around the idea of um, learning from our hunter gatherer populations and the way that <laughs> children learn um, and the determination that children have to learn, regardless of somebody telling them how to do that mm. or the best way to do that. Um, so if anyone's interested in this kind of idea of self-directed learning, um, the Summer Hill schools are a really good example of how that's being put into place um, using things like restorative practice, trauma-informed practice um, and the idea of self-directed learning through a complete overhaul and shift of the curriculum. So um, I am a little more extreme, I think, in my views than Sarah, who thinks there's lots of good things we can keep because I'm, I'm starting to veer towards the idea of let's have a complete overhaul and change. <laughs> OK, so um, this idea kind of links in. We were having a discussion the other day, girls, weren't we, about thinking about home education and why are more families home educated? Um, and what knowledge and understanding do EPs have around the idea of home education, um, the idea of hybrid models um, that were developed over COVID and why that was effective for some children and young people? And then how that, of course, links to our cohort, children and young people that are, are not in school, you know, which is huge, actually. Um, the research is telling us those numbers are growing. Um, you know, what is it saying about our education system that children are finding it so hard to even kind of enter the building? Um, so I think those, those thoughts are really important to reflect upon. Um, and, and the idea of self-directed learning is very fitting, isn't it, with, with home education and what the young people were saying about enjoying having the choice, enjoying having um, the time and freedom to do more research and to use um, different tools in their learning. Yeah, definitely. Sorry, Maddie, I moved you over onto that slide too quickly because I hit that instead of my mute 
button to come back. But I think we can work together. There are things to keep and things to change radically. And um, I think this idea around hybrid learning is probably one of those key things of bringing stuff together. You know, that there's a really strong and positive home education network out of there. And that's, you know, th there were some positives that came from children and young people um, doing their own thing as both our research show during the pandemic all of that vocational stuff the baking the the functional skills that, that are often lost nowadays you know even things like cooking and, and life skills uh, aren't, aren't thought about in schools and one of the key things that came up for us was things like children wanted to learn about how to do their taxes how to write a cv and and things like that so you know I, I think we do need to think about these hybrid models and and listen to what children and young people actually want to learn and um you know make their learning suitable for the 21st century so um which which includes um you know even timetables we know that secondary school pupils are actively um, less likely to get up early in the morning. Their, their, um, <laughs> their rhythms and their, their body um, wakes up later. So start later at school and they, they might be more engaged and motivated to come. So, yeah. Yeah, and just with the hybrid model as well, it's just really a great opportunity to support young people pursue a passion, to pursue their interest in a way mm. that they can. And it's not something you have to do in your spare time. It's something that we want to foster and develop and really promote, which will very much link into their self-determination, their autonomy, their feeling of competence, which is all positive things for their well-being and for their learning in general as well. So just really helping them explore who they are and helping them providing space for them to become that person that they want to be and to explore all of those avenues um, which is I think can, can only be a positive thing within an education system. I think we're going back to Maddie with the trauma informed. We are but I'm aware we're very much running out of time so um I think what I'm just going to say on this is that I am really interested um, in anyone else out there who might be doing any work on trauma-informed approaches in their local authority. This is something that we're really keen to embed throughout our, um, our schools in Nottingham City. Um, so, yeah, please get in touch if you've got any good examples of how that might have worked in your own local authorities. Yeah, definitely. And on the back of that, I think we, we do need to think about the, the various layers of trauma that COVID has brought up. You know, we, we've talked a lot here about education and, and change, um, but there's a lot about the difficulties with emotional well-being, mental health. And we know there are children and young people out there that had a really tricky time in terms of poverty, in terms of need to use food bank, in terms of increased domestic violence. Um, so, you know, even young children coming into school, having had that, that really different experience of just early years of not being around people, not experiencing that kind of group um, socialisation, they're, they're all slightly trauma um, experiences when they are then put into a big group or a different situation. So I think the more that we have trauma-informed approaches embedded in what we do in schools, then it, it's kind of going to meet the needs of so many children and young people and adults as well. It's again, no brainer, like Maddie said about something earlier, but I am aware we have gone over time as usual. <laughs> um, but we um, we say we, we hope that we you will engage with us on Twitter, continue this. We are continuing to do lots more research. Maddie mentioned the Summerhill Children, uh, Summerhill School. We're presenting at the festival this summer. Um, at the moment, we're doing a pre-recorded session for the Rethinking Education Conference, which tickets are on sale for at the moment. And it's amazing we've been invited to do some talk around our pupil views work at an ELSA conference in September as well. Um, I'm involved in a power threat meaning framework special interest group, which is really looking at these ideas about how we rethink education. Um, we're all thinking about further dissemination, writing and research. And, you know, it's, sometimes we feel like we can't make a difference as EPs mm -hmm. and our voice isn't heard. And, you know, we're, mm -hmm. we're just kind of this little minority shouting into the void. But we have all made a little bit of an impact with the work we've done with this COVID-19 research. And, you know, we contributed to the update 
adopted nice guidelines for SEMH. You know, we're, we're there. Our research is there in the evidence, which is an amazing contribution to think that the, the pupils that we spoke to and shared their views with us then went on to inform the nice guidelines. So, you know, I think that that's a real testimony to the work and what we can do as EP. So keep up the good work, everyone. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to mention the book? Yeah. So finally, uh, we have contributed a chapter to this fabulous book all about um, lockdown and the experiences that were had. Um, and this was based off of our very first initial piece of research from Southend. Um, and as I said, it's a chapter in the book, but there is chapters from many different professionals and it's a really interesting read. So. I personally very much recommend it. Please do um, have a look at it. There is a 20% a, a discount code there for you um, if you would like to go and purchase it. But it is really interesting and it really does show about all of the different experiences our children and young people had um, through the pandemic. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, we've gone a little bit over, so thank you if you stayed and um, thank you if you're watching back later. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.